it's Philly. I mean, Philly's not just a one-day race. It's a happening. It's a classic. You know, I mean, when you're sitting on that start line at 9 a.m. in the morning and the flags are out, the people are out, the big screen's on, you've got the commentators going nuts. You know, you've got 256 kilometres with, you know, 10 or 15,000 people up on the wall. This is it. This is the event. You know, you can just feel it. You can just feel the vibe. It's the biggest one-day race in America. Everyone wants to be national champion. In the world of cycling, there's one championship that matters, and that's the road racing championship. If you don't get excited about being at a race like that, it's time to quit, <laughs> or you should never start it. All the best guys are trying to be in their best form for the race. This is the show. This is the big show. This is big time. This is where everybody really wants to perform. You get superhuman efforts. Somebody might want it worse than the rest of them. To take the win itself, that's huge. If you have the chance to put on the, the red, white, and blue jersey, you don't even feel tired after racing for six hours. This is the 20th year of the event, and they've probably never had two identical finishes. It's not just a race, it's a happening. It's like Paris Roubaix, you know, it's the helicopters and the mud in Paris Roubaix here, it's the wall and the beer and the shower, and people screaming at you, and you got the form, and you're dropping guys behind you. Every year they come to be part of it the U.S. Pro Championships. A Sunday in June that can transform a rider's career. While Philly waits, the week opens with races on Tuesday and Thursday. Lancaster and Trenton, classics in their own right. HealthNet will be a major player all week. Hey, John, do you want to stay at my house for a little bit for any reason? Uh, I think we live hard. When we moved to HealthNet, or when Mercury kind of crumbled, I said, listen, I can't win a lot of races. But if you give me Gord, I, we as a pair, he can win and I can help him win. We have the best, deepest team. I mean, we're pretty good at assessing riders and, and maybe their potential. Just Jason McCartney, he's obviously proven to of Georgia, 200 and some odd K off the front on the hardest day of the race. Pate's got the raw natural talent. John, least one, Chris Weary, and that's one thing that we we definitely built this team on. We wanted to have as many good character guys as we could. A few hours before Lancaster, Sayers and Gord get the guys together. When you get out there, man, don't open the throttle and run it wide ass open. I mean, get out there and just do the minimum. If you get out there and you make a mistake and you get dropped, you put us behind the eight ball, and then you got to come back to the van and deal with me. So <laughs> <laughs> don't do it. Yeah. Just have confidence in the fact that you can go all the way to the finish as long as you don't w out there just freaking firing off bullets all over the freaking place like a cowboy. <laughs> Please, just holster that shit and wait to the end. <laughs> Tonight will be the first real test with Lancaster. You know, 90 miles on hills. We'll really see who's going good. This is a hard race. It's uh, You always get a really good view of what the rest of the field has for the week. You know, you, you're going to know if some guy just storms away tonight and wins solo or something like that. He's the guy to watch for Philly. So these races are very important to find who's got form and who doesn't. Lancaster. This race historically gives the teams a lot to consider. And of course, a good performance here is always a nice way to start the week. For the first time in years, Bobby Julik's here. The field will keep him on a very short leash. And if Bobby's reputation wasn't enough, his CSC team is stacked with talent, including two-time Lancaster winner, Jakob Peel. But Bobby and Jakob will have plenty of company around the front. Welcome, Brad Rodriguez, Chris Horner, our U.S. national champion. Here's the guy in Philadelphia who pulled it all down and he has worn this jersey for the last year. Here it is, Mark McCormick.
Lancaster's a brute of a race. Relentless ups and downs will take their toll, and just finishing demands top form. But still, two of the strong guys attack. David McKenzie and Ivan Dominguez go off the front. But holding off this field on this course will be tough for any small group. Still, Horner and Leeswin are the next two to give it a go. No way. Give these two 30 seconds and it's over. The field will bring them back before the start finish. It's only two laps to go. The fans watch and wait to see who might take a shot at this race next. This looks like one of the CSC heavy hitters. That's Bobby Julek! Bobby Julek all What a homecoming for CSC superstar, Bobby Julek! For me to come up here in the middle of the season and train at altitude, I spoke with Bjarne Reese and all the directors of our team CSC and they agreed that this would be a great time to use as a build up for national championships in Philadelphia and then uh, the Tour de France. When I think back to 1998, it all happened so fast and there were so many things going on during that tour. All of a sudden I was catapulted to being on the podium and then being the second American at the time to be on the podium and then being the next Greg LeMond. And that three week period was amazing. It felt like everything that happened was supposed to happen. One day that probably not many people know about was the day that was canceled. The day we just basically rode the whole stage tempo. I thought when I woke up that morning, I said, getting a podium on the tour is not gonna be possible for me. But then they canceled the stage and I was able to have that one more day of recovery, and then that was all I needed. My poster of motivation, it's a, a podium of guys that uh, have had their difficult times. Um, ending with Marco's passing this last year, Jan with his weight, me with my head, and it just was, uh, you know, I thought it was going to be the start of us being on the podium quite a bit. And unfortunately, it was the last time that we're, that I was on the podium with those guys. That was a pretty special day. And uh, never forget that one. I wasted a lot of energy in 99, 2000, and 2001. Now, this year, I think I finally found again um, the mindset and the way of dealing with stress and the way of dealing with things. The guidance that I found with Bjarne this year, you know, I can only imagine if I would have met him four or five years ago. I know I would have been back where I was in 1998. And a lot of guys in my position would have just said, you know, you were third in the Tour in 98, you know, you haven't, you were seven, you know, the best you've gotten since then is 17th and basically you've not been a non-factor in the race since then. A lot of guys would have just said, hey, it's over. You know, I had my, you know, peak and it's over. But there was something in my body that was telling me, God, it's here, that, that energy, that, that drive is here. Just, I can't, couldn't get it out. And that was so frustrating. On one hand, it was frustrating, but on the second hand, it was the reason why I kept going and why I'm still here today. And they are going to have, when we see them, one lap to go. One remaining lap to go. One racer, looks like he is away. Bobby's effort is huge. He's been away for a lap and a half. But one glance at the front of the field tells the story. The horsepower chasing him is overwhelming. Health net, postal, navigator, and Chris Horner himself. No one rider could hold off this kind of firepower and Bobby will be caught inside the last kilometers. 
Lancaster will belong to somebody else this year. Wednesday. This could be any one of a thousand hotel lobbies anywhere in the country. But during Philly week, it becomes race headquarters. The day between Lancaster and Trenton, the teams take a break. It's a chance for former teammates to catch up, talk about yesterday's race, and discuss who's going well. Freddie's used to winning field sprints, but yesterday got away from him. Francisco Ventoso from the Spanish team Protier nipped him at the line for second. But not all Pro Deer's riders are from Spain. Tim Johnson is an American and part of the next generation of U.S. cycling talent. He's here to help guide his Spanish team through the week. Your team is obviously well aware of Fred. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Tuesday in Lancaster, we're getting towards the finale. I was like, hey, Ventoso, como estas? You know, how are you? He's like, bien. I'm like, all right. You know, and I, I showed him Charles Dion from Web4. I showed him Mark. And he was already on Freddie's wheel. I'm like, all right, well, I guess he's he, not right. He knows right where there. he wants to be. <laughs> so at the end of the race, he's like, yeah, number 21, ready. I was with him. Yeah. I'm like, hey, good job, man. <laughs> you had it all set. 22-year-old kid just sticking on Freddie's wheel and beating him in the end. For him, on Sunday, I don't know if everybody races the race aggressively, there won't be 50 guys at the end. It'll be group five, group five, and 20. Right. But if everybody races defensively, then, yeah, there could be 50 guys, and it will be a sprinter. And that's when Ventoso will win. While Tim and his pro deer team have reason to be happy about Lancaster, so does Postal's Michael Creed. It was his teammate, Max Van Hayswick, that crossed the line first. Like Tim Johnson, Creed is part of the future of American cycling. Last December, while waiting to see if he would even have a job for 2004, he got the dream call. I got a lot of offers from D3 teams for you know, like basically no money. And it was to the point where I've been racing D3 since I was 17. Yeah. So it was like, I've done it. I know what it's like. You know, I'm, I'm 23, but this was my seventh time racing Redlands. Yeah. I mean, I've raced it every year since I was 16. It was like, I don't need to do it again. And it was, if I wasn't gonna make the step, I was just gonna do a Division Three team a disservice by riding for them. Because maybe they would put in some kind of hopes on me and I was, I knew I wouldn't do it and man, it was just like, I finally just kind of told myself to go down to, go down to New Mexico, Silver City, New Mexico. There's no cell phone coverage. There's, I'm the only pro bike rider in town. And I'm just gonna go there and I gave myself a deadline, which was like December 20th. and. I rented a house there, and I was like, I'm gonna train until December 20th, because December 22nd is the deadline to stand there for enrolling to the local college. On my way down to Silver City, I uh, I get this phone call from Pat McCarty, who's on the team. And I'd already been making, like, kind of like throwing stuff at Postal, but I didn't even think they were picking it up at all. And he calls, and he's like, oh, dude, uh, Lance said he's gonna sign you. I was like, what? He's like, Lance, he said he was going to sign you. And I, I shit you not, right then my cell phone goes out. <laughs> I go over the mountains. There's no cell phone coverage. So it's like 10 o'clock at night. So for like the next couple of days, I'm just, I was completely crying myself. Call, pat back. And just, yeah, that's what he said. But nobody contacted me forever. And finally, um, I got a call from Johan Brown December 10th, December... 12th, saying that he was going to think about it and he needed a week. So a week to the day on December 18th, I got a phone call and it was, yeah, there's no contract negotiations. There's nothing at that point. You're just, just set to go. Thursday, Trenton. 90 miles in three hours. It's a race where the pure sprinters can have their day if they're on form. 
It's also only three days to Philly, and if any sprinter smokes the field here, everyone will know his team will be riding for a bunch finish on Sunday. What's going on? We have a top out? Yes, sir. Trenton couldn't be more perfect for Jonas Carney. He'll lead his Jelly Belly team today, but Sunday will be a different story. You know, I just feel like it's always important to, to, for your team to ride like a team. And um, anybody who's ever ridden on a team that, that, uh, where there's a lot of guys sacrificing for each other, they know that that's how you win races. Anybody can win a race here or there, but the teams that dominate and the teams that win a lot are the ones that really sell out for each other. And, um, you know, Prime Alliance was like that, Coors Light was like that, the LA Sheriffs were like that, um, you know, Saturn was like that at times. Um, you know, and, and, and you even look at the smaller teams, like a Team Shackley or a Jelly Belly, when, when, when they do win a race, they win it because um, the team rides like a team. And it doesn't matter if you have a million dollars or if you've got, you know, a third of that. The team that wins is usually the, usually the team that, that sacrifices. So. Um, the guys sacrifice for me all the time in the criteriums. They're always up there trying to help me. They're taking me to the front. They're chasing stuff down. They're leading me out. I can't contest Philly. It's over my distance. Uh, and um, I, I ask, every year I ask the manager to let me ride it, uh, put me on the roster so that I can give everything I can for the guys to show, you, show them that I want to repay them for all the hard work they give me in the criteriums. And we spend a whole year traveling around in a van with the guys and getting to know them. And, living in hotel rooms, when you do sacrifice and you see eight guys sacrifice for one guy and you pull it out and you pull off the big upset against the big team, it's, it's, there's no feeling better than that. And I'd say that at least half of my favorite memories of cycling or, or more are races that I didn't win. It was just races that I, I helped someone else win and uh, where we pulled off the big upset. And, and uh, you know, Philadelphia, if we could pull off the jersey in Philadelphia, and you know, if one of the guys walked away with it, you know, it'd probably be one of the highlights of my career. Before Philly, there's still today's race, and the Navigators would love to head into Sunday with a win here at Trenton. If anyone can spoil it for the pure sprinters today, it would be Hank Vogels. Yeah, I want to go through the small corner through there. You know, you know what I'm talking about, though. You know the two left-hand turns, and we're all together there, and there's like a no left-hand. Left 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 the two left-handers. Left and a left. To the left yeah. and a left and the right, going uh, to the final straight. I want to go. Yeah, the right, the right, left, yeah. left, and left, and then it's like 500 yeah. meters. You know what I mean? Short Jump a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah like not a bad thing. It's right. a good way because it's yeah. narrow. Yeah. 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 And then you go. And he had to take. He's gone. Oh shit! Just yeah. fan out. And it's if anything, I'd fan say it's out and then jump off. Slightly on. downhill. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah like it's no, fast that you can. Nothing. That's good. That's what I want to do. And if we're all there together, I want to jump into that corner. I want you guys to fan out and then jump on whoever comes past. Just hit the brakes. If Hank does attack at the end of day. His ex-Mercury teammate, Chris Horner, will probably go right along with him. Uh, you guys get me nervous or something. Everyone like, getting coffee. Running around, it's, getting dressed. You're racing getting, to get coffee. I'm just sitting here having a hamburger coffee, and fries. You, you guys are like, <laughs> the way you guys got a little hurry to you, too, I'm getting nervous. <laughs> they're, getting, they're, they're getting nervous because John and I know where the coffee shop is, and they don't. Ah, so. uh, okay. Yeah, it's all like it's all about getting to this corner if you want to go. So we gotta, you know, we gotta, we gotta link up and do that. Give me your address and all that. <laughs> that was the time to go if you wanted to go. Yeah, it was a bummer. I was like, okay, there's got to be at least two guys that come up, you know. But I knew everyone was right there, and I just went anyway. I mean, I was stuck at that moment too, but I said, now's the time to go. But then uh, with half a lap to go, I just knew it was over.
The Trenton course is basically a long straight road with a big loop on each end. After they've left the start line, the riders loop through this park where the feed zone is. The descent out of the park is at full speed, and in later laps, gaps can be very difficult to close here. Once they're out of the park, they'll head back down the straightaway, passing the start-finish area. If today's race ends in a field sprint, this is where the battle for control of the front will take place. After another series of turns at the opposite end of the course, the riders complete their first seven-mile circuit by crossing the finish line. A six-man breakaway leads through the feed zone. Mike Sayers is here, but with Gord in such good form, chances are HealthNet will be one of the teams riding for a field sprint today. The Sayers group has almost a minute but with more than two hours to go, the attack has not yet sparked a full-blown reaction from the field. But on the next lap, everything changes. Chris Horner has dragged a group of riders up to the brake. Now the move is suddenly very serious. CSC and Postal immediately put their big guns on the front to shut Horner down. During a chase like this, all the other riders can do is sit in line and hold on. There couldn't be a worse time for a flat. Even with a quick wheel change, catching back on when the field is going at this speed, on this course, will be nearly impossible. And the Cola Vita rider will pay for his bad luck. Gustavo's not the only one who had bad luck, while CSC and Postal drill it up front. Apoto's team leader, Eric Saunders, is also forced to chase after he flats, and the bad timing of his mechanical will mean the end of Trenton for Eric. Soon after, Jason Bausch punctures as well. Did you flat too? Yeah, yeah, I flatted. Who all flatted? Everybody flatted. I had flat and a bad wheel change. If you flat like through the turny part, hit the hills, you can't use the car at all. And all the cars stop at the top of the hill. So all the cars are instantly a minute behind the peloton. And if you're in the cars over here, you're a minute down. Zellner says, oh, just forget it. And I just was kind of didn't want to forget it because I was feeling good, I wanted to ride. And then he comes to me and says, no, really forget it. You're gone, you're not going to get back. And so then I, then I kind of believed him. You don't want to believe it first. You can't the talent in America is more dispersed among the teams than ever before. Eric long ago established himself as a serious threat in the pro peloton, and he could likely find a job on almost any big team. But instead, Eric's chosen to lead Ofoto. When we talk about the race Sunday, he, he sounds he has a lot of confidence right now, and he's riding really well right now. He's strong, he's been training really hard. Um, we did a lot, a lot of, couple local races back home, and and he, he has it together. And um, I think, personally, I think he could finish top five if if he's in that right mood. If he's in a good situation, I think he could definitely podium as well. You know, cycling is basically proving to yourself who you are, proving to yourself what you can be. Um, proving to yourself that you can mold and shape um, your body, your form, 
you know, your, 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 your morale, you know, it, it's really like a constructive kind of like artistic process, you know, that's a lot like, you know, sculpture, you know, you are your final outcome, you are your product. When I first met him, I, I would ask him like, well, why aren't you winning? How come you're not winning? What's the problem? Or, you know, I was like, what are you doing in this career? What, you won one race the whole year? What the hell? Why did you get another career? And he was like, no, that's not how it works. It's not about the winning. And I thought, well, what's the point? If you're not winning, what's the point? <laughs> There's a lot of guys that never win. So if I win two or three races in the year, like I consider myself lucky. You know, obviously, I'd like to win more, but it's hard to win. If the ideal is you win 15 or 20 races a year, anyone else that doesn't win 15 or 20 races a year just isn't good. I'm still grounded enough to know that I'm doing well, almost as well as I can do. If you don't win all the time, then it's hard to you know, walk around like you're a super champion. So that's why I say uh, I'm not any good, because I mean, I know how good I'm not. And I think being an experienced rider has a lot to do with knowing how good you're not more to do than with knowing how good you are. You go through a period of time where you're, you're gaining some experience and then you start to realize, well, hey, it's a lot about digging deep when you see the opportunity arise. The best riders know who can beat them. And a big part of their success has to do with wiping out the chances of the guys behind them. So there's guys who could say, okay, if I'm not careful, Saunders can win, but I know him well enough to know that if I do any one of these three things, I chop his chances of winning by 60%. And the really good riders know that. They can size things up and, and they understand how not to make the mistake to open the door for another guy. The entire game plan in cycling is closing everyone else's doors. That's pretty much what you're trying to do. You can explain tactics as you know, drafting, leading out, blocking, blah, 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 but it doesn't really speak to the main issue, which is closing everyone else's doors. Some guys' doors, you can just close it. You can't put a lock on it. Some guys' doors, you can close and put like five bolt locks on. You never have to worry about them. Some guys' doors, it's a fight to close it. And some guys' doors you can close it, don't have to put a lock on it, but they won't have the sense to open it back up again. And I think that I'm the, the type of rider when I have a lot of form that I'll like try to open the door again, always trying to keep the door open. And I think that when I'm really good is when I can close some people's doors too, or like sneak around when they're not looking. I think I'm a guy that people know that if they give me half the chance, I'll take it from them. Eric won't get that chance today, but Philly could be a different story for him and his team. Back in the feed zone, Postal's Tony Cruz finishes off the Horner breakaway, and the stage is set for Trenton's almost traditional field sprint. Right now, Tony Cruz is absolutely killing it, and that's what we're talking about. Postal this entire pack together, ladies and gentlemen, there is one remaining lap to go. As the riders move away from the park for the last time, there's a half a lap to go. From this point on, it's a chaotic non-stop battle to the finish. Towards the line, Lars Michelson from CSC, all of them 
giving it everything to try to get to that line. And let's give these guys a big round of applause because these are the guys that made the race happen. We are going to make it official. Brad Rodriguez wins here again just like he did back in. Carl's got stuck on the right, and I was on the left, so I went in there. Came out a good spot just behind the navigators. They were doing a pretty good train. When we came out with two corners to go, it kind of you have you have one corner and it with well, it's almost like two and a half because it kind of sweeps. Yeah. So just before the last corner, though, you're in the sweeper there. The navigators had two guys, and Power sat up and opened the gap up on Hank Vogels and then took me to the curb, the left side curb, and was bumping with me as I was trying to get through them. And I knew I was the only non-sprinter there, so I figured I'd go ahead and close it because I ain't going to win anyways. And I was just hoping Charles was, you know, somewhere, somewhere behind. behind. I don't know where, but somewhere. You know, I was hoping he was, you know, somewhere top 10. So I just closed up on Hank. And then Hank looked back and saw me coming. And, and so I kind of stayed like a bike length and a half behind him, hoping that he'd Easy. keep keep going, like he'd keep going. And I'm getting... You know, not much of a draft, but something at least to keep going. And then he sat up, so I used what little punch I had, but I never even got around him before all the sprinters started coming around me. And, yeah. Ah, I'm not a sprinter, I'm just trying to, you know. Save it for Sunday. <laughs> wow, I'm trying to help my sprinter out yeah. and stuff and, and just, you know, get in there. If we didn't have a sprinter at all, I just, I wouldn't even bother closing the gap, but I just sat on the other sprinters and got, you know, tried for top 10, top right. 5, or something like that. But I was hoping Charles was somewhere back there. To the top block from the Computer Sciences Corporation Team CSC. Here's Lars Michelson. We help that team. Yeah, Here he is. Yeah. And he came for the event to the very finish. And he finishes one down. Yeah. Yeah. If you look at when I grew up, I mean, I think the talent we had in, in, in L.A., in California, was huge. I mean, I didn't win. It wasn't easy for me to win. It was harder for me to win back then than it is now. So the talent pool was great. Uh, it was just who stuck with it, who, who put in the hard time. Because I had hard years. I had hard days. I had times when I, I, want, I wanted to quit. I still do. I mean, I'm hard on myself. I'll have, I'll put... I'll put limits on myself. I'll say if I don't if I don't achieve a certain level, maybe it's time to think about something else. And I think, but at the same time, I still want it. So it's not like I'm giving up. I'm basically saying I really want it. So I better show that I really am capable of doing that. Or you you only know what you, your environment is. So I've always wanted to be on top of my environment. If that was winning the ziggurat, then I wanted to win the ziggurat. If that was, you know, all of a sudden I saw the U.S. Championships or the U.S. National Junior Championships, I wanted to win the Junior National Championships because that's what I knew. And then every, you know, it's baby steps. Next thing you know, I was invited to go to the Worlds. I want to win the Worlds. And, and I went to, you know, my, my world just kept growing. You know, my life just evolved. And I kept stepping into it. Because sometimes even when I, I and, I'll, and I'll notice that myself, I'll, I'll be, I won't be, I'll, I'll hesitate taking taking uh, to leadership, and that's because I'm scared, and I'm scared of, of failing. But I'll know it's like I have to take that leadership because sometimes just by allowing yourself to to get into that position, you have to uh, rise to that occasion. And uh, in some you know somewhere deep inside you 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 you've done it so many times, and that's what you're driven to do. So it comes out even when you don't have the legs that day. After I win a big event, like when I won the last the stage in the Giro d'Italia, I always get this 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 tranquil sec, you know, time where, where thing just stops. Everything just there's no happiness and there's no sadness to me. It's just just this flame level of where harmony basically. And that's what and that's what I that's what I find when I win. I get yeah, of course I get that peak of I just won, but then I get that just sometimes right after the event 
and I'll get that just harmony feeling where I'm like content. I'm not happy, I'm not sad. The Stars and Stripes. Today is Mark McCormick's last day to wear it. He finished fourth at Philly last year, but he was the first American. And that made him national champion and gave him the jersey for the past 12 months. Tomorrow's race is the only national championship in the world that allows foreign riders to compete, and every team has some. Obviously, a foreign rider can't be America's national champion. So for a non-American, the only goal here is to win the race, and the $40,000 that goes with it. You know, like you look at um, U.S. Postal, and they're probably here to win the race more than they are to win the jersey. So. They, they probably, if, if Max Van Hayswick's in a break, he's not going to sit on to say, well, I got Antonio in the, in the bunch. You know, our team might play that tactic. We might have a foreigner in the break, and he might not want to contribute, knowing that he has an American that could win the jersey. So every team has their own agenda, and that's something that we have to try to figure out what that is. For me, it was, it was uh, I was playing the finish back in my head a lot because I finished fourth and only a bike length from winning the race overall. I was ecstatic about winning the jersey, but I was, oh, how could I have won the race? You know, how did, what could I have done differently to cross the line first and not just first American? So there's almost that little guilt, like, oh, I didn't, I didn't win the race, but at the same time you have that jersey in your bag driving home, and it's really hard to, uh, it was hard for me to get down on myself, but at the same time I felt like there was still a little bit more that I could have taken from it. I don't want to say it haunts me, but it's the, it, it keeps me wanting to come back for more. I mean, yeah, I'm the reigning national champion, but I didn't win Philadelphia, so to speak. I was the first American, which is a huge honor, but there's still three more notches I could have improved on, so that's why I'm back this year. This team's kind of neat. This team Last year was young pros who really didn't have much of an idea what was going on. They, they may have had the talent, but there's a big difference between having good legs and having brains to back it up. And this year, what with the demise of all the trade teams last year, a lot of really top-notch talent came online and we scored big time. We picked up Chris Horner. Horner's been the top cyclist in North America for the last two years, and I don't have any doubts it will continue this year. He pretty much, uh, he raised us to another level, and he pretty much did that solo. He's such an easy guy to work with. You don't get the feeling that he's miles above you. You get the feeling that he's one of you. You can't overemphasize it. He's like the the old gray beard master on top of the mountain who has come down and told the peons here's what you have to do to be great and the beauty of it is there's no egotism on this team they literally do every single thing he tells them to do you just can't beat Horner for the teaching aspect of it never mind he's got a motor the size of a you know, 427 Corvette never mind he's gonna hurt you day in day out never mind he breaks legs He's our leg breaker, and we're going to support him in any fashion we possibly can. When I joined with Webcore, everyone was telling me, oh, you've made a big mistake, you should have come joined our team, and this and that, you're not going to be able to win any big races. And honestly, I didn't know. But all I know is that was the same situation that I was in with Prime Alliance. With Prime Alliance, we had Danny Pay, that was proven, and we had Jonas Carney, that was proven as a sprinter. And then with Webcore Builders, we had Charles Dion and we had myself, but there was no Danny Pay. Now, I didn't know that the Webcore riders, I didn't know that they would actually step up, but I was hoping they would. And I was a little uncertain at first, but once we went, once we did the road race at Pomona, I was, as soon as we finished that, I was like, oh, we're winning Redlands. There's definitely a good old boy network out there. You know, there's favors that are made and returned during races. No one's going to pass up a win. No one's giving up a win. If someone can win, they're going to win. But if they can't win because they're just not having a good day that day, they're going to make room for you because they know you can win. I know most people by name and I can 
in the race, just be like, hey, just give me a little room, huh? I need a little help here, and, and they open up a spot for you. You know, they're not going to do that for you when you're first coming up through the ranks. They don't let anyone in they don't trust. They see a guy next to them, they don't recognize a jersey or know who they are, you're not getting in. There's no doubt about it. If I'm going to lose the race anyways, I'd rather lose it to someone that I know and that's a friend of mine and help him win and then later when I have for him, I know he's going to be there to open up room for me that I can possibly win. Versus if you just got some young amateur kid, what's he going to do for you at the next race? Nothing. Honestly, he wouldn't even know you opened the gap for him. He'd think he made the gap. You gotta give a little bit, and then it gets returned later. It does, it, it really does, but the amateur guys would never understand it. Even a neo pro wouldn't realize that that guy helped you out. Maybe just a little bit. Maybe you would've won anyways, but the fact is they just made it a little bit easier for you. But those kind of favors get returned all the time, and that's good old boy network right there. <laughs> that doesn't get any more good old boy. <laughs> yeah, there's no doubt about it. You know, at US Pro Championships, you got to use the energy wisely. That's the main important thing, is just to use the team wisely. Don't have them chasing stuff that's not important. As long as the European team missed the move, then it's, it's going to come back. With all the different European teams there, there's more teams to do the work. It's $40,000 to win that race. So the European teams, they're going to be there to win that race too. CSC comes to Philly hoping for nothing less than a victory. Saturday afternoon finds the boys in a banquet room at race headquarters. Their sponsor is so committed to the riders that it moved the company's annual meeting to the first week in June so that the employees can root for their team in person tomorrow. For Bobby and his CSC teammates, this is a chance to meet some of their most dedicated supporters, and the guys would love to pay them back with a win tomorrow. Thank you. But every other team will have its own plan, Saturday is nearly gone before the riders know it. Team events and short rides are done. The only thing left to do is meet one last time. Cola Vita will help Mark defend the jersey. HealthNet may have more cards to play than any other team. And of course, they always have Gord for the finish. Jonas has done this race a dozen times. His experience will help him guide the numerous serious contenders on the Jelly Belly team. Sierra Nevada's manager, Kurt Stockton, won the Stars and Stripes jersey here in 1990. He'll have Trent Klasner and Eric Wahlberg to read the race for his young team. This race really can bring out the, the best. It brings out the best in a lot of riders, especially U.S. riders. For the, for the early guys, it's, it's important that you all be really diligent. Stay at the front. The minute you're, you cover an attack, don't think, oh, I just covered an attack, I'm going to go back 60 or, guys. I mean, the wall is steep. It's hard to attack from behind. So you're going to get about halfway up that thing. If you guys get to the halfway point, which is about where the showers are, you know what I'm talking about, the water shower? When you get to that point, if the break hasn't gone away and you guys want to start it, that's where you can go. If it's a group of 20 or something and it splits in half, yeah, please make sure you keep in the front part of the split if it happens. Cause well, we want to have somebody in the early breakaway, and I think that we should have a handful of guys going for going to get in the early breakaway. Doug for sure. You know, if I see Freddie at the front and staying at the front, then I'll stay at the front. But if I see Freddie sag climbing, then I'm gonna sag climb. Same thing with Julik or Horner. I, mean, I don't say follow like one wheel. I'm saying just follow go with the flow because it's just kind of a constant rotation of 30 and 40 people going here and 30 going here. Let's say we okay. have come off the wall and we are riding well, for door. Well, lap eight, lap nine, <laughs> lap 10. That's, That's when it hits the fan, and you're going to see when it's going to hit the fan because you're going to see all the CSC guys and all the Postal guys mm -hmm. drilling at the bottom of the wall. I should have a pretty good idea of how I'm feeling, so you guys will probably know from two or three walls out, 200K mark is the key for me. So. Laps 8, 9, and 10 are much more intense coming to the wall. I mean, if we can get slotted onto the CSC train or the health net train or something like that. You know, because it's going to come down to 8, 9, and 10 laps. Is what it's going to come down to. That's where it's going to split every lap up the hill. Somebody's going to have to go to the front at 8, 9, 10 and, and set these guys, get them into the wall in the top 20. I mean, if it blows up on the wall the last time and if we are the scattered that comes from behind. Line. Typically, I mean, who's to say? I mean, we could be totally mispredicting the race. You've got to out there and be yeah. very, very patient. I mean, better very shape doing that than you will be if you try to position yourself, you get swarmed. In.
I think everybody just showed their cars in Lancaster. Jack Appeal showed that he's strong. Bobby showed that he's very strong. And Hedwig's there. Uh, Leishman shows he's strong. Corner's there. With Webcorp, you go onto the race and you know these guys are going to look after you from the start of the race almost to the finish where you have to go to work. To ride down Benjamin Franklin Parkway with 10 seconds on the guys behind you is an incredible feeling and you always want to recreate that. You get the Europeans racing for the win and you get the Americans racing against each other for the jersey. But every once in a while the Americans take it to the Europeans and win both. I don't care what anybody says. I'm tired of people talking about other guys out there who know how to sprint, but we have the fastest guy on our team. Last year I was there in the last lap. I moved only a little bit, like 10 or 15 positions back. That's it, gone. I was like, oh man. So this year I'm ready for that. If it's been hard fought and there's 10 guys that get there together and it's very competitive and it's just toe-to-toe -to -toe slugfest, taking one in the head, giving one in the head, that to me, is as good as winning. But if I can make the front group and be in a position to help these guys, the best thing our team can do is have as many strong guys left at the end as possible. I mean, Max has shown that he can win any race, but we want the jersey and obviously we want the win. And hopefully I'll be feeling awesome today and I'm gonna go for it. Philly, a race that has become legend over the last 20 years. 156 miles, six hours, 10 big laps, three short finishing circuits, 200 riders. As the riders head away from the feed zone for the first time, every team knows that an early breakaway is bound to go like it does every year. The question is when. Out on Kelly Drive, the guys who have the job of covering the early break ride the front in case the move rolls away. Manny Yunk. The run into the wall is a battleground. Every team wants to lead through here, but at 45 miles per hour, it's not easy. This time, only the riders assigned to cover the early move need good position. But as the later laps approach, this is where the all-out brawl will take place. Every team leader will want to be on the front so they can have a clean shot at this right turn. The road goes from four lanes to two to one to the wall. The Maniunk Wall. It's the most infamous section of the course. The measuring stick, the proving ground. If you're not one of the first few guys to hit the base, you'll be in no position to match the attacks. There's no break yet, so HealthNet decides to play the first card. Danny Pate opens a throttle to see who will go with him.
Danny has drawn out a small group of riders with his attack, and as they go around the right turn at the top of the wall, the next few minutes will determine how many guys try to follow. Any team without good representation will either have to gamble and hope someone else will bring it back, or do the chasing themselves. After the fall from the wall, a group of riders comes together along Kelly Drive. A look around shows that the break is huge. 29 riders have made this split. It's the largest early move in the history of Philly. The first time over Lemon Hill and the break is beginning to settle in. 15 teams are here, but some will be happy with their odds and some won't. Five hours from now, Lemon Hill will offer one of the last places to attack. Coming back onto the parkway, the start-finish line is just to the rider's right. As the break goes under the Big Mo television, heading toward the fountain at Logan Circle, many of the riders are rolling through, and the time is starting to go up. The field is nowhere in sight. As the gap grows, teams will have to decide whether they should keep working or not. Coming out of the circle, the break will have about 500 meters to the line. There's still nine big laps to go, but at the end, this is where making the right split-second decision will mean winning or losing the race. The break passes the start-finish line, and still, there's no sign of the pack. Finally, the field comes onto the parkway and rolls toward Logan Circle. The race favorites are all here, but none of the big teams are chasing yet. As the field rides under the Big Mo television heading toward the start finish, a glance back at the screen would show the massive breakaway already out on Kelly Drive, heading for Maniunk, nearly three minutes ahead. Out of all the teams represented here, HealthNet is in the best position by far. They have five riders in this move. Sayers, Pate, Greg Henderson, Scott Moniger, and Mike Jones. Nearly every other team has only one or two. With Sayers and the boys dictating the race up front, Gord can sit back in the field with his four other teammates and never hit the wind. It sucks when you try to play a little poker and try to pan off a little bit of, of work on other teams and try to call their bluff and you know if you lose that way you'll second guess yourself for you know nights on end afterwards. So we've always been at the philosophy that you know um, we would like to earn whatever we get even if we have to do it the hard way. There's a lot of teams out there that on paper should have, should have and should take more responsibility than us but I think Gordon and I agree it's always better to take the responsibility and come up short than to sit back and not take the responsibility and come up short. Back in the feed zone, the field is four and a half minutes down. None of the teams with race favorites back here are happy with this break building time. But each one hopes that if they hold out long enough, one of the others will panic and start chasing first. 140 miles to go. Pate, Sayers, and Henderson drive the break, leaving Moniger and Jones protected here in case this move makes it to the finish. As Pate takes Moniger up to Jones, HealthNet has now dictated the shape of things to come. Passing the boathouses, the field moves out along Kelly Drive. The biggest teams have the most to lose, so major players like CSC, Postal, and Freddy's Aqua Saponi team all have a rider or two stay near the front to at least keep the group moving. Up ahead in the break, one of the teams willing to help the HealthNet boys is Sierra Nevada. They're the only team here with three riders, Glenn Mitchell, Ben Jacques Main, and Trent Klausner. A few years ago, Trent was the number one rider in America, and he's had great performances at Philly. But today, he'll give up his own chances to help his two teammates. You know, 15 years ago, I said, if I'm not making actually a salary after five years of, you know, racing on my own, living in my pickup and traveling around to all the races, then I'm going to quit the sport. And one of my long-term goals was 2004 to retire from cycling. And um, 
this year, you know, it's my last year, you know, I wanted to come back to kind of a grassroots, kind of a smaller team, which, you know, had potential to grow and help help the team and help younger riders, you know, expire, uh, inspire them to, you know, reach their true potential or whatever. And um, this year I cracked about four weeks ago. I mean, I actually fell apart to where I was done. I mean, I couldn't even ride my bike. I didn't want to look at my bike. And um, self-discipline is such a such a huge thing in cycling, the work ethic, and you know, you don't have anybody telling you, you know, you have to check in at this time or anything else. You have to have the motivation and the, and the will and the power to, to get out there and do it. I'm just so stoked to be on this team with the younger guys and Kurt Stockton. You, know, you have teammates like Eric Wolberg and Glenn Mitchell and you know, the young guys like Ben Jock Mains that, you know, these kids are good. Some of these kids on this team, they have true potential to make it in the sport. And you know, it's a hard, long fought struggle that if they, if they put forth the effort, they will make it. After leading most of the way up the wall this lap, Trent is forced to chase on the descent. But as they get down to Kelly Drive, Trent catches back on, where he will move right back to the front to go to work. HealthNet is relentless. With the help they got from Trent, their gap has continued to climb. They'll head out on the fourth lap with more than a five minute lead. After the break comes through, Frankie Andreu checks a monitor to see where the field might be. Frankie's done this race so many times, he knows that this move is starting to pose a threat. So right now, the race is a big group in the front, and this actually can be quite dangerous. A few years ago, I remember actually the race, the year that Sean Yates won this race, the very first lap, a huge group of almost 20 riders went away. Every team had representation up there, and that created chaos because no one in the back wanted to chase, and that front group just rode away for all 150 miles, and Sean Yates was the eventual winner. Sean was one of the most respected riders in the pro peloton and that respect earned him a job as director of CSC. Yeah, our biggest fear is that we, you know, we, um, we screw up, you know, and, and make ourselves do too much of the work. We hope someone else will chase. But ideally, you want to have four or five guys to do the lead out in the last two, three kilometers. Whereas if you start chasing with three or four laps to go, you like to be pretty tired and not be able to do that. If you've got 10 riders, yeah, then you can you just sacrifice four. You still got six left, but you've only really, when you've only got seven, you want to hold two back for the sprint. You know, and leaves you five. So you don't want to be riding around the front. You've got to stay low, otherwise you show yourself at the front. People are going to think, okay, they're going to chase in a minute. We'll just let them do it. If you stay low, then they're going to be like shit. They're going to start getting nervous, you know, and hopefully, and they take that to chase themselves. You know, you just got to bluff. Coming off the wall, one of the teams that isn't bluffing in the break is the Navigators. They have only two riders in this move, but one of them is Vasily Davidenko, and he's easily the fastest finisher in this group. That means back in the pack, Hank Bogles and the rest of his Navigators team have a free pass not to chase. Swinging into the feed zone to start lap five, the break now has more than a six minute lead on the field, and HealthNet's not done yet. Finishes off lap five up front. Kolavita's Mark McCormick is back in the field. 
He knows the move is still gaining time, but he's experienced enough to gamble that the bigger teams will eventually have to chase, and he's saving his strongmen for the later laps. Two of the guys Mark will count on most in the end are Yvonne Dominguez and Aaron Olsen. Cyclists know about sacrifice, but Yvonne's path to Colavita was unusually tough. You went to the, in Cuba, the dream is to come to U.S. from everybody. Oh, U.S., U.S., and nah, nah, nah. There's no future there. So, like I said, when I came here in 97, I uh, came here to do some track race and uh, for like maybe a week, I went back. And when I get back, I saw my best friend. He was like, what are you doing here? I said, why? You went to the United States, you didn't stay there? I said, no, you know, I don't want to stay for now. We talk sometimes about maybe I'm going to do this, maybe I'm going to stay in the United States or in Canada or, you know, I was living there for 22 years. I have all my friends there, uh, my mom, my brother and sister, everybody there. So it, my hand was like a little bit full, you know, in equal. I was like, if I stay, I'm going to have future, even if, if I'm not going to ride a bike, you know, I'm going to start walking or do something, but I'm going to have something in my life for the future. But then this thing, I have my family, my brother, my, you know, my friends, you know, my everything. If I stay there, yeah, okay, Ivan Dominguez, the best in Cuba, na 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 na, in five more years, because in Cuba, in the Cuba national team, it's like that. When you turn 28, 29, hey, if you don't have any uh, good results, hey, you're getting all. And I was like, I'm 22. In five more years, six more years, maybe I'm not gonna do like right now. Now, and they send you to your home and you start doing something bad, you know, like because you wanna make some money and, and you're going to have the police behind you. And I was like, I don't want that for my life. I wanna go to sleep with my head clean, you know, my. I was like, I stay here, I want a future for my life. And that's better for my family too. And I spoke with my mom and I said, hey, you don't worry about me. Here I I got everything, you know? If I work hard, I have whatever I, whatever I want. And uh, if I work hard, you can have whatever you want too because I'm gonna send you money and uh, maybe I'm not gonna go there maybe in five more years or something, but you know, you're going to still have whatever you want. Whatever you need, you call, you ask, and, so when I came here, I said, well, I'm not going back. Yeah. I think uh, right now we have Mark, he won last year the the jersey. So I think we're going to try to keep Mark safe for the end too, you know, to see if he can have the jersey for the second year. Just with my age and Mark is, has a much faster finish, I have good form, but I'm 100% happy to work for Mark and Yvonne for the finish. My time will come in, in in more years when I'm you know faster and stronger, but uh, I I see myself in the in the finishing in the front group and, and being a you know a strong a strong teammate for the lead out or for to chase anything that happens towards the end. Aaron and Yvonne will be looking after Mark for the rest of the race. When the field finally finishes lap five, they may be shocked to hear that the brakes lead has risen to nearly seven minutes. The Health Net boys have been going all out for more than three hours now. On the run into the wall this lap, Mike Sarah's flats. But up ahead in the break, his teammates will slow down just enough for Mike to get back on. And as soon as he does, it's back to business for Health Net, and the gap will continue to grow. Far behind, just coming out on Kelly Drive, the field will start looking for a reaction from the teams with a true race favorite. Freddy Rodriguez is certainly one of those riders, but he's not going to put his whole team on the front just yet. It's, it's a gamble. I mean, it, there's, there's, there's a there's certain risk involved in the way I, I, I race the event. At the same time, that's the only way that I, I could assure myself of winning, or else I'm, in, I'm more playing for just a result. I'll follow a plan, but uh, basically for me to win here, like I've done every year, I have to sacrifice a lot, lose it all. It's a race of attrition, and I just let I let the attrition take part of the race first, and I always play my cards at the end. And the day that that doesn't happen is the day I'll lose, and I'll, it might happen this time, you know, like an early breakaway, a breakaway that goes halfway, or an attack that I didn't cover. I've always had the, the comfort that when my team comes here, 
totally for one reason for me. It's because I want to be here. All the teams I brought here, and every time I sign with these teams, it's like, I go, okay, I'm, I'm going with you, but well, I have one request. I need to race in America. And Philadelphia, for sure. And, uh, and they always accept, and so they're coming here for me. So all the pressure is just, it's, it's, it's just me. The team has no, no, no expectations other than it'd be great for, for a win and everything and, and carry the jersey, and it's, it's a very nice image in, the U in Europe. But the stress is all on me. I have one game plan, and I make the game plan, and I stick to it. Freddie will wait to commit his team until much later in the race. But when Postal puts a couple of its guys on the front to ride tempo, Freddie sends up two as well to try to keep this break under control, and the gap is no longer growing. The break has reached a massive eight minute lead, but the time is now back down to under seven. Still, thanks to HealthNet, the damage is done. With the lead this large, the riders sent to cover this break now realize that there is a chance it could make it to the finish, and if it does, their teams will be counting on them to deliver the win. Under the bridge and HealthNet is gonna play this move to the end. They'll make it as hard as they can for the chasing field. Postal has had Pat McCarty and Michael Creed covering this break all day. They've both done this race many times, but neither one has been in a leadership role for Postal before. So this will be my fifth time. Um, I finished once. Uh, I'm not so good with the distance. I'm getting better, just surely because of my age, I believe. Um, seems like right about at the 100 mile mark, it doesn't matter what kind of form I'm in or how I'm feeling, just right about the 100 mile mark, the lights usually went out, but it seems like as I get older and older, it gets a little bit longer and longer. Um, but this year, you know, I don't think that matters so much as just doing my job and getting Max, Tony, Barry in really good spots. While Creed has done everything he can for his team up to this point, the tension in the pack is rising as the field comes under the bridge. The time is still falling. Hank Vogels will be the first to the base of the wall. But Creed's teammate, Michael Barry, goes down. Michael is up and gone before the end of the pack is even through, but it could have been much worse. Hank Vogels had a good reason for wanting to lead through here. I can remember little bits about my crash last year. I know that I attacked out of a breakaway up a hill, a very steep hill, went across the breakaway and was in front of the breakaway. You know, I know pretty much a near-death experience last year with that crash. And crashing at 100k now, head first into a guardrail with all those injuries, and I was lucky to be riding, let alone walking. And uh, I mean, they said they said I wouldn't ride again or run again, but you know, I'm racing again. I crash three to four times a year, touch down, 50, 60k an hour into a barrier, into on the ground, on the concrete. Lost a lot of skin on my elbows and hips, and. I've only broken my skateboard when I was 19, and um, this crash, I like, broke my C7 vertebra and smashed my left talus ankle into about 30 pieces. So the doctors were, uh, they had to operate straight away. Um, I could have waited to see a specialist for my ankle, but uh, they thought I was going to lose the blood flow to my foot which means I would have had a club foot, fused ankle, which would never work properly ever again. Had, you know, would have had a limp. And uh, I, t I, t I, was, well, I was sort of conscious, I don't really remember any of it for about, I still don't, but they uh, put six three and a half inch screws in my ankle. And um, you know, I lost all the skin down the right hand side of my body, 18 stitches over my head, nine over my eye, massive concussion and total pretty much amnesia for the time I was in hospital for 10 days in the, in the emergency ward of uh, UMass Memorial in Boston, but that was a horrific crash. I mean, if I added up 50 crashes, it probably would have only equaled that one. So I don't remember much of it and uh, put me straight into full depression too after about two months, you know, just from the 
post-traumatic stress injury, so um, which I'm still struggling with a little bit, but it's better every day. So, but my life definitely, definitely uh, makes you look at the small things. I mean, I've got two children now, and when it happened, my wife was pregnant, so I had another one on the way. So maybe it wasn't my time to go then, but uh, looking now, you know, everything, every little cool thing is a little bit cooler. Um, makes me appreciate life a lot more, I can tell you. Lance asked me that in Tour of Georgia. He said, has your life changed after you crash? And I said, yeah, it has. You know, I still moan and bitch, but um, definitely appreciate things a lot more now. I can just tell you that's for sure. Sarah's and Pate refuse to give in. Lap eight, and they've lost Henderson now. The two of them will tap deep into their reserves so that Moniger and Jones can have as much advantage as possible when the attacks out of this break inevitably come. Only last week, Henderson became the world champion in the points race. Today, he buried himself for more than 100 miles. I was 100% eh, for, I mean, I wasn't too sure what sort of range I had, um, obviously coming straight off the track. But um, Patey and I were just yeah, full gas from lap two, basically, and uh, yeah, we got a big gap. We got up to we got a call at eight minutes at one stage, and then uh, I just drove and drove and drove, and then seventh time up the hill, I got popped and I couldn't get back on. <laughs> Monica's in there, looks like he's breathing through his nose. Um, what you say is now as well, and uh, looks like Mike Jones is starting to come in now because. The hammer looks like it's going down in the bunch. <laughs> we might be in a good position. The CSC have been in a lot of matches now. Um, Postal have been on the front for a while. So who knows? Fingers crossed, eh? Less than five minutes behind, the field comes in to start lap eight, and the big teams are down to serious business. Postal, CSC, and Pro Deer have agreed to dedicate a few riders to chase all out. And while five minutes is not a small gap, this is the kind of alliance that could bring the break back. Screaming through the feed zone, the field is taking huge chunks of time out of the break. Kelly Drive. Danny Pate has to get out of the saddle to keep the pace up now. Five hours ago on this road, he was smoothly driving this move along at over 30 miles per hour. Four minutes. Suddenly, there are 10 riders from different teams in the rotation on the front. The field can sense that the race is changing. The battle for Maniunk, laps eight, nine, and 10. Health Nets boys have been in charge all day, and now one of the protected leaders in the field about to start this battle is John Leishwin. Basically because the, the wall itself is not long, but you've got five minutes of psychological and physical pressure, which is just almost unrivaled in, in any other race in America. So you're on a flat road, but it's wide, and there's 175 riders battling to try to be in the top 10, going through those tricky corners to the base of the wall. So a lot of riders really are consumed by this fight. Every rider is just on the rivet as you go underneath this bridge. Your heart rate would be 175, starting the wall. But you can't even hear yourself think, much less talk on your radio or talk to a teammate near you. Every single rider in that single file line is a bike length off the rider in front as you go over the top. You see this big Mo television screen that's two stories high. The motorcycle usually is covering the first few riders, and then it might be you. And you know that that's one of those laps where you're at the front, you're making the race. The 10 riders around you could be the final break. You know, I've gone so hard at that point that I couldn't feel my fingers and toes. 
my heart was pumping everything it could into the major leg muscles, tunnel vision even, to where it starts getting black around you. And that's what it is to really, really go hard. The breakaway heads up Lemon Hill. Health Net Scott Moniger and Mike Jones know their time to go to work is not far off. Three minutes behind. But for the first time in the race, the field is on the same stretch of road as the break they're chasing. Sayers, on the parkway now. Out of Logan Circle, Pate comes up and lets Sayers know he's still here. A glance to their right, and they'll get their first glimpse of the field in five hours. The field could almost reach across the road and touch the guys in the break. The gap, two minutes. As CSC puts all its riders on the front to join Postal, it's no longer a question of if they'll close the gap, but when. The break heads toward Manioc and the CSC-led field will be here any minute. Jonas Carney's been in the main bunch the entire race, but his job for today is done. It started out really slow today. You know, went hard on the first, the first time up the wall and the breakaway went right away. And um, the field just stopped pedaling. I mean, like, what, it was like 25 guys? They went, and man, everybody just, the field just, we were riding around like 30K an hour, just, talking, eating, hanging out, and they got seven and a half minutes, like, real fast. And uh, then Postal and CSC went to the front and started riding tempo, and, and they were riding tempo. They weren't messing around. I just spent my day bringing the guys to the front, trying to get bottles, trying to take care of Candelario and Bergman and, and uh, Ben. I got them to the wall, like, you know, I made it eight, eight times, and uh, which is a lot for me. So, But I, <laughs> the sixth time up, I got dropped, and then I, I told them, I like, you know, that's probably it, you know? And I, and I, I got back on, and then I was like, all right, the next time around, I, I, and I chased, chased hard, got back on, and then the next time around, I got dropped again, and I chased again, <clears throat> and I caught back on again. So we're coming around for the eighth time, and then some guy through the feed zone slams his brakes in front of me. I, I had a bottle in my hand, and I hit my brake, and I was like, my rear wheel was probably like 10 inches off the ground. So I threw my bottle at him, you know, one of those days. Well, he opened this enormous gap, in the feed zone, and it was single file. And I had to chase for 5K through the caravan. I finally caught back on 2K before the wall. They were getting to the base of the wall in the top 20 every lap, and it's just gonna be a matter of like whether they had the legs or not. So we'll see. On the Maniunk run-in for what will be his last time today, Sayers does a final turn on the front. Mike Jones acknowledges the effort. There's sure to be a split on the wall this lap. 130 miles into the race, and Creed is the first out of the tunnel. This time up, every rider will simply go as hard as he can. Jones is the first to move to the front. But Jones is only halfway up the wall and the field is already flying through Manioc. It's CSC that wins this round, and Bobby Julek goes through the right turn second, in perfect position. If there was ever a time for a big move, it's now. Up in the break, heading toward the top of the wall, Sierra Nevada's Glenn Mitchell delivers and leads around the right turn. Down the fall and the selection's been made. The break, once 29 riders, will now be down to 11. Alessandro Donani, Monagra and Jones, Davidenko, Tim Johnson and his pro deer teammate, Angel Gomez, Ernie Lechuga, Postal's Michael Creed and CSC's Jimmy Madsen, Sierra Nevada's Glenn Mitchell and Ben Jacques Mains.
When Madsen goes straight to the front and takes a massive pull, the other riders must be wondering what he's thinking. Madsen's a proven pro, but a powerhouse like CSC couldn't be happy with odds of only 1 in 11. A moment later, his motives are clear. Bobby Julik has come across from the field alone, and now one of the strongest teams in the race is in the best position. None of the race favorites have made it up here with Bobby. A solo bridge like this confirms what everyone suspected. Bobby is on great form and super motivated. I've looked at George and Kathy and Fred Rodriguez and these guys that have had the jersey last couple years, and I tell you, I just salivate over it. When I'm riding behind them, I'm just like, oh man, that would be so great, man. I, you know, they have the jerseys made up, they have the gloves, the socks, the hats, you know, who knows what else they have made up, stars and stripes. So, you know, I've always wanted that. I've always wanted to have the opportunity to, to wear that jersey. If you win that, even once, you've had a successful career. I mean, you were national champion of America. Not many people can say that. Just to wear it once over in Europe, I couldn't think of anything better. That jersey does special things. Bobby's move has multiple effects. If this group can make it to the wall the 10th time, Bobby will be in a great position to launch an attack that could win him the race. But this move has also shifted the burden off his CSC teammates back in the field and onto the other big teams. Chasing all the way to Maniunk will seriously hurt any rider's chance of making it up the wall the last time and being around for the three short finishing circuits. Bobby and Madsen drive this move out of Logan Circle, and the field enters on the other side of the road, chasing all out. Heading up for lap 10, it will be a race to the wall, and it's desperation time for the big teams in the field. Driving a breakaway for the better part of five hours is the ability of only a few. Sayers and Pate have put their team in a great position. Moniger and Jones covering the break. Gord sitting in the field with four fresh teammates. And the health net boys are right where they wanted to be. We were in a tough spot because we definitely had good numbers up there and it was a good break, but it was so far to go. And But I think we did the professional thing. We, we put the team on the front and we drilled it and that's the professional thing to do. So, I mean, I've always been about riding professional and that was a professional thing. And Danny was uh, three guys today, so, you know, I mean, he was... <laughs> torturing the old man today but <clears throat> it was good I feel good about our chances and it just happened that I was one of the workers today because I wasn't on the best of riding for him maybe but I had a good ride today and uh, you know it doesn't really matter what happens in the race as long as I can put the herd on Sayers <laughs> so if I can do that I'm happy Kelly Drive Webcorn Postal know this is bad. Both teams are aware of the danger Bobby's breakup ahead represents, and a new temporary alliance is formed. Webcor is laying it all on the line, and Horner stresses to his team the seriousness of the situation. And finally, for the first time today, Chris's boys have the opportunity to do their part. 
and give their leader a shot at the Stars and Stripes jersey. Webcore and Postal put an end to Bobby's move, and the break hovers just in front, about to be absorbed by the pack before the run into the wall. Maniunk, lap 10, all the team leaders are here, and the race is about to go to another level. Colavita's Ivan Dominguez shows why he's known as one of the fastest guys in the sport, and wins the most important fight so far today. He and Mark McCormick go through the right turn. One, two. Ivan hits the base of the wall in front. And then Horner, true to form, turns the unthinkable into reality. Horner's move on the wall will go down in Philly history. For the first time ever, one rider is attacking lap 10, bottom to top. Only three riders have survived the Horner assault. Fred Rodriguez, Navigator's Kirk O'B, and Postal's Michael Berry. Down on Kelly Drive, O'B, Freddy Rodriguez, and Horner are all willing to work. They know Postal's Michael Berry will not. Michael won't like his chances against these three, and with a finisher like Max Van Hayswick behind, he has the right to sit on. Alliances shift, and two teams that have been enemies all day get together to try to save any shot they have at the race. CSC's Jakob Peel and HealthNet's Jason McCartney set their sights on the Horner Rodriguez group. Pio closes the final gap, and the Horner attack is over. Once again, the race is wide open. The 10 big laps are behind them, and 55 of the 200 starters remain, including all the race favorites. Prodier sits on the front. The young sprinter, Francisco Ventoso, has survived and Tim Johnson's Spanish team will try to keep this race together for a bunch finish. Some teams will want the same thing, but others won't want to take that chance. Point out on the short laps only now. Each of the three small laps will include a trip up Lemon Hill. This is the last place for a late attack. Prodeer and HealthNet protect the front for their sprinters. But over the top and on the descent, the pack splits apart, and a small group is forming off the front. These are the riders that know if they want to avoid a bunch finish, they'll have to take their shot at the race now. One of those riders is Eric Saunders. 
there's the guys who can win in their head, and there's the guys who have the ability to win, and then there's the guys that will just win because they have the pedigree, the team, they've been doing it longer than anyone else has been doing it. I think there's less than 10. Eric knows beating those race favorites means he has to attack, but this one is about to be caught, and Eric will have to hope he gets another chance before the sprint. Around Logan's circle, Aqua Saponi and Prodeer put it all on the line for their sprinters. Freddy's team knows he can deliver here. Prodeer has full confidence in Pintoso. Just behind Prodeer, Bobby Julik does his part for Lars Michelson. Pushing their way to the front, Healthnet moves up to keep Gord safe, and the first small lap is done. What's left of the field comes through the feed zone and hurls itself toward Lemon Hill. The battle for position is heating up. John Leishwin and Bobby Julik drive the front to keep the speed high. Just behind the health net train, Mark McCormick and his trusted teammate Aaron Olson wait for the field sprint and the right moment to start the lead out. But up front, heading into Lemon Hill, is one rider who doesn't plan on waiting for the sprint. Once again, Horner throws down the gauntlet in front of the entire field. Chris has won nearly every major race in America, most of them more than once. But the Stars and Stripes jersey has always eluded him. An effort like this could put an end to that. When I show up there, I got a leash on me that's attached to every rider in that field. And I got to cut every one of those leashes before I can get away. Versus a lot of riders don't have a leash at all, or some riders have a very, very long one. Even though Chris knows every rider in the field spends most of the day waiting for him to go, that doesn't keep him from attacking the race. You got to want to go. It's in the blood. Four riders have done their best to follow Horner. Arcadius Wojciech from Poland, Jelly Belly's Caleb Mannion, Healthnet's Bryce Jones, and Sierra Nevada's Eric Wahlberg. But at this point in the race, Chris isn't looking for help, and the four chasers are having trouble closing the gap. The four chasers aren't Chris's only problem. Just behind them, Freddy's Aqua Saponi team and CSC are sprinting all out to bring Horner back. Horner can see the four chasers finally closing in and decides to wait. Five riders together now head toward the start finish. All five have given it their best effort, but the chasing field will prove to be too strong, and with one three-mile lap remaining, a bunch finish looks like it might be inevitable. Horner, still not ready to quit. Health Nets John Leishwin and Jason McCartney take control of the front but Freddie comes up with two teammates and the jostling begins.
McCartney fights his way back to first position and buries himself for Gord. The navigator's challenge with five riders lined up just to his right. Every team wants to keep their sprinter out of the chaos in the middle of the bunch. Lemon Hill. Coming off the descent, and it's strung out at more than 45 miles per hour. Heading toward the parkway, just over a mile to go. Freddy is right where he wants to be, and so is Pro Deer's Francisco Ventoso, just to his right. Half a lap to go, and a Seiko rider dangles off the front, about to be swallowed up by the pack. Entering Logan Circle for the last time, and now the race belongs to the field sprinters. Five hundred meters to the line. Colavita's Aaron Olsen is first out of the circle. Mark McCormack right on his wheel. But the navigator's train takes over and the sprint is on. It's Pro Deer's Francisco Ventoso. Gord Frazier is just behind. And Freddy Rodriguez is the first American. For the third time in his career, Fred Rodriguez is the first American across the line, making him the only rider in history to be pro road racing champion three times. He'll proudly wear the Stars and Stripes jersey for the next 12 months. like oh boy here we go and Horner puts an attack right at the bottom and I'm on his wheel and just like <clears throat> you know oh here we go and just uh, went up at my own pace and probably crested 10th or 12th and and I was like all right game on now let's hope that this break comes back and uh, we can we can uh, play for a win and I got on Chris Weary's wheel for a couple laps and he was he was kind of jerky for a while, and I said, Chris, you got to make those efforts really subtle. So, and he did. He smoothened out, and we just he just surfed me for the for the two two small laps, and uh, that's probably what saved me for a good sprint. So, good teamwork. You know, I needed just a little bit of luck there, and 
I was on Van Hazewick for a while, and I think he uh, he went to jump and his chain fell off or something. And then I had to close. He had Fred's wheel, and then I had to close to Fred's wheel. And then kind of got surrounded, and uh, you can play this one over and over a hundred times. It's hard to have the ideal scenario. We're pretty happy with what happened. You know, when I had Fred, Fred was driving hard, and Kirk O'Bee was coming through. Michael Berry wasn't working because he, he wanted to bring it back, but go up the road, hit him, three against one, take a chance. And then if you're if it's if it's me and Barry going to the line, I'll take those chances. Or me and, and OB, I'd even take those chances. And he's fast for me, but no one's gonna go. None of us have plans of going to the line with Fred. So let's just get the gap and then hit him. But you had to have Bobby J too. For a split second, I thought. I could like I thought I could win the jersey coming around the roundabout and I started to pass guys and I could see the hole and I thought to myself I can win the jersey I can win the jersey because a strong man sprint like this after a long race is, is what I'm good at and there's not too many sprints like that in the United States so you never get a chance to show that talent but maybe two or three times out of the year and finally I have the form to show that you know, so I'm happy with my race because I've never felt so good in such a big race. Yeah, I felt really good, you know, we just kind of got boxed in on the left side over there. Warner kind of, he looked like he went and then he just kind of died and then the barriers kind of come out, you know, and we just kind of got boxed in and guys are just going backwards, you know, and just, I had nowhere to go. Yeah, I had a punch in mid-race and couldn't get the 11 and I knew I was going to need a big gear for the sprint, so I, uh, I, had a, I had a Mavic spare which was only a 12 and I changed it and then the gears went right and I had troubles with that and I ended up getting a spare bike change and then that was didn't work and I had to get a seat change and then went back to my normal race bike, but that wasn't the reason I wasn't the winner today. Kirk was our main man today. He went with the finish. He went with the first group over the last climb, and obviously one of the strongest riders in the race. And uh, I mean, the selection is always last time up the hill, and he was there. So we decided he was our man today, and we had the big strong boys, Rapinski, Power, and myself, to lead him out. But unfortunately, headwind sprint, maybe not not enough horsepower there at the finish. And uh, I mean, he was still leading with 20, 30 metres to go. Well, I just kind of saved all of my, my last gas right last time and looked after the top, looked back, and believe it was only the four of us, so I didn't think it'd be that selective, but maybe it was a little too selective because it was just wasn't the right combination, and three Americans and you know, just one, you know, Michael Berry, he wasn't going to work, so oh, it was good. I mean, that's, that's the way the race goes. It usually works out like that, but came down to field sprint and boys led me out I just didn't have it the last hundred meters I jumped a little too early and just especially for that length of a race but I uh, got to give it a go so well maybe next year it wasn't a good break because it was only two and I suppose there's about 25 in there um, with about three to go people started dropping and uh, Julek came up on the second to last, and he was just flying. He was just, I, I knew I had to just stick on him, and every time he hit out, like, I had to react immediately, otherwise it took me 300 meters to close the gap to his wheel. I hit the finishing circuit with the lead group, so I really want to do that, but I've never finished a race either before, so steps. Coming to the last climb, I was behind Mark, and Mark, he was behind Will, but uh, I saw the uh, Will, he was a little bit losing his speed. Maybe he was uh, trying to save a little bit. And I started hearing like, like the people, like they want to come, you know, before the climb, you know, going to the climb and take, yeah, yeah. So I was like, whoa, I don't want to get stuck here. And Mark, he was there. If, if the people pass in the right, we're going to go like far behind. You know, I said, well, I'm going to go straight to the climb to see what happens. So I went to the front, and he came behind me, and we turned in first and second, and I think Aaron, he was there too. As soon as I came to the bottom of the hill to start going, uh, I mean, to put some pace there, opponent attack, and I was like, well, he, he attacked so hard. And uh, I was like, well, I look back, and I look more, he looked behind, no, nobody went with him. I think two more riders, and that's it, and I was like, well, from there to the to the end of the climb, I was 
training. You know. But I was good, legs good, you know. I try. What I appreciate now is to realize what I do for a living is an amazing thing. I want to have a perfect day, a perfect race, every single race, and until I get to that point, I'm just going to keep going until my body can't do it anymore. If everyone does their part and we don't win, if we just get beat, I mean, hey, we just got beat. I've met thousands of people who love the sport who aren't champions, they're just people who like to ride on a Sunday and they look up to me as somebody who can ride the Tour de France, who can ride Paris to Bay, who can win Philadelphia. Maybe I'm an inspiration to them to see me riding so fast and uh, that's a good feeling. If I thought at this point that I would never be a contender, then I would quit. That's what I get out of it, as I see improvement and with that, you see yourself in the stars and stripes. through 